So Dongwei actually, um, before he came to Boston College, actually he was originally from China, got his bachelor degree of um, USTC, University of um, China, University of University of Science and Technology of China. And then he went to Stanford, we have a PhD with Professor Hong Jie Dai. At that time, um, doing nanowires and germanium, silicon-based nanowires, and electronic property. And then went to um, Caltech with um, postdoc with Jim Heath. And then after two things, 2007, um, Dong Wei has been a, um, through the tenure chair and uh, has been there and until here now, he's uh, the professor in chemistry. Um, I have known Dong Wei's work since, since when I actually first came to grad school because he, at that time, he works on nanowires for photoelectric chemistry. Um, so I really, one thing I really like about his research, maybe he's going to talk about it a bit today, is his emphasis about the fundamental um, insights at the photoelectric chemistry, photocatalysis, electric chemistry, especially for small molecule activation like splitting water um, and CO2 reduction, recently methane activation. At, and I think one unique thing which I really like is the how to elucidate the molecular nature at the solid, li solid liquid interface at the same time connecting to some terminology that solid state physicist may talks about or physical chemistry talks about. Um, he's very, um, and at the same time, his lab is has done wonderful work about nanomaterials, nanowires, gas phase synthesis, especially atomic layer deposition, and also other electric chemical application, including lithium battery, organometallic, um, switchable catalysis, as um, our center is um, interested about. Um, Without without further ado, and, and I just think, um, I, I will give time to Don Wei, please. Thank you very much, Chong, for the very generous introduction. It's a great pleasure to follow up with the successful webinar started by Paula last month. And uh, today I choose a topic on electrochemistry. I would like to use the top use this opportunity to talk about this topic that many of us hear so often, and this is especially true. Uh, given the explosion of research on batteries and electric catalysis. Well, with this you know, almost overwhelming coverage, you may be wondering what else to hear today? What can you learn really in 45 minutes? If you stick with me a little longer, for a couple more minutes, I'll cover this topic. My hope is really try to, uh, I I'll share with you some of the thoughts I had while preparing these slides. My hope is that I will be able to shed some new light on uh, experimental technique for us who are not trained as electrochemists, um, and particularly us chemists who have an interest in using this technique for synthesis purposes. I realize that our audience has a very, diver uh, very diverse background. I will try to be as general as I can be, but please uh, feel free to stop me if I say something wrong. Or I fail to make myself clear, or you just have a question along the way. Before going too far, I wanted to have a shout out to our faculty colleagues of this newly started center. This is a, a NSF Center for Chemical Innovation. Our center is community called Center for Integrated Catalysis. If you have seen Paula's webinar last month, you should know what this means now. If you haven't, I encourage you to take a look on YouTube of the recording. Our Twitter account now is live. Please follow us for updates. You can also visit our website for updates and announcements. Our director here is a, a Professor Paula Diaconestru. Uh, she's at UCLA together with Chong Liu. And we also have a Professor Lloyd Daw from University of Houston, Professor Alex Miller from UN Chapel Hill, and also Jeff Byers and myself from Boston College. So it's only been a month, but I'm really excited because I have learned a lot. And uh, in particular, I wanted to you know, have a shout out to our uh, team. This is a picture taken last month. Paula also showed it in her webinar. I just wanted to use this opportunity to express my gratitude to everyone. Uh, it's less than two months. I already learned so much. This is because we all bring to the table uh, expertise, almost cover the whole spectrum. Um, so it's just such a great opportunity. Especially, I wanted to thank today Hao Chuan Zhang, who is a fourth year graduate student, a spectacular student in my group, who is part of the center, also helped me uh, prepare today's slides. In answering the question why I choose electrochemistry for today's topic, I think it helps for us to do a quick recap of our center's mission. 
our goal is try to synthesize materials with controlled structures at the molecular level for desired properties. Electrochemistry is actually quite prominent here. It can be used to switch, for instance, to convert a bonding and cheap precursor to something useful that can be readily used for copolymerization applications. It can also be used to toggle the reactivity of a catalyst from active to inactive and vice versa so that you can control the sequence. You can achieve the temporal and spatial control of the inc incorporation in a polymerization process. When you combine everything together, of course, that's our grand vision, which is integrated catalysis. So within this context, I wanted to ask the most hard question. So I chose the topic for the relevance with the center, but when I really sat down, started preparing for today's webinar, I got stuck. I asked myself the question, why do we need to hear another talk on this topic? Many of our students are probably taking or have already taken a course on this topic, electrochemistry. And some of our colleagues are probably teaching one. There are so many good uh, textbooks already written, probably now more famous than the one by Alan Bard and Larry Faulkner. There is a whole society, International Society of Electrochemistry, which publishes a suite of journals that report the latest development in this field. Let's not forget that you know, there are also multiple centers. The most recent one would be a phase two CCI center on electrochemical synthetic organic chemistry. This is led by Professor Shelley Mintier at University of Utah. Not to mention there are many other uh, DOE and NSF, NSF, NSF centers focusing on energy storage and electrocatalysis. So the real question with this is to ask is that what else to hear? So I spent a little bit of time thinking about this. And mostly I was thinking about our audience. For our students, I hope I'm not offending many of you by saying that few of us are trained as electrochemists. What that means is that most often we are interested in electrochemistry because we enjoy the benefit offered by this technique. That is, it can provide or take away electrons on demand. So our interest in the fancy electrochemical techniques may be not particularly strong. So through my lens, what I hope to share with you today is some lessons we have learned in using this technique for a number of interesting chemical reactions. And through my lens, I hope you will be able to uh, kind of learn the lessons I have learned and also find opportunities that you previously may not have seen. So in order for us to dive into this, let's take a step back and take a look at the essential component of the electrochemical system. It's a fairly simple system. What you need is electrolyte. What the electrolyte does is to support the ionic movement. What you also need will be electrodes. What the electrode does is that they can be connected with the external circuit and then to support the electrons flow. So the process is typically that there will be exchange at the interface. Electrons can enter one electrode, passing through the external circuit, going to the counter electrode, and then be returned back to the solution to maintain the electrode neutrality. So two electrodes and the electrolyte, the three component system is essential component for electrochemical systems. And sometimes you do need an additional auxiliary electrode uh, for reference, calibration of the reference. The driving force of this process could be twofold. And if it's a electro spontaneous electrochemical reaction, the chemical potential difference between the process taking place at one electrode and the other would be the driving force. But more often, we often see the externally applied potential would be the driving force to drive the chemical reaction. For such a simple system, three component minimum system, what could go wrong, right? It's such a simple system. So if you think this is you know, overly simplistic, well, we can actually even further focus more and zoom into this interface. By definition, only electrons is allowed in the external circuit. 
And hence, we can see that only electrons will be collected at the one electrode. Let's say this is the anode because this is where oxidation takes place. But by definition, the electrolyte will only support ions to move around, meaning that the electrons, ideal electrolyte shouldn't support elect the electron movement. So clearly at the interface, some sort of chemistry must take place. A reductant is oxidized to oxidant, for instance. So unless you're interested, and that's okay if you're interested in that, but unless you're interested in using the oxidation product, which is essentially a, a chemical oxidant for the subsequent chemical reactions. And this interface would be something that you should focus on. Of course, there is a large body of research focusing on using the oxidized product for subsequent chemical reactions. But as far as the chemistry of a subsequent chemistry is concerned, uh, this chemical oxidant wouldn't be different from a one you can achieve by a chemical oxidant. So what I'm trying to say is that for electrochemical system, the most unique component in comparison to many other systems may be at this interface, the electrode electrolyte interface. So this is where things can get very interesting. And that's essentially the focus of my talk today. And in thinking with this thought in mind, you know, I set the today's discussion focus on the possible reactions at this interface. And more specifically, I would like to focus on the reactions that may not be your desired or targeted reactions. And then what I wanted to show you is that a lot of things could happen. And many times this reaction is not entirely controllable and you may not even be able to fully understand it, but it doesn't mean you cannot take advantage of it. And most important of all, I hope you will come to appreciate the complexity of the system and then understand the implication to your intended application. In other words, I want you to be able to leave, learn to live with them and also try to take advantage of them. And let's also not forget that electrochemical system really requires at least two electrodes. I was only on the previous slide, only using one, focus on one slide, uh, one electrode uh, to illustrate the point. For the conservation principle of matter and charge, we must pay attention to what happens on the counter electrode. In my opinion, this is one of the probably the most weak link in many systems focusing on using electrochemistry for synthesis purposes. If you don't understand or control what happens on the counter electrode, you are producing a lot of junk that could get in the way of your targeted reactions. So the choice of counter electrodes can be crucial. In connection to this, a lot of thoughts have to go into the design of the cell. So you need to separate the reaction on the positive electrode versus the uh, negative electrode. If you do that, what are the implications? So those are some of the uh, discussions I wanted to have. Given the time, maybe we'll spend most of the time talking about the first point, but toward the end, I will illustrate uh, the cell design considerations, choice of counter electrode, et cetera. Again, our target is still, our focus is on the, uh, with the chemical synthesis in our side. I figured for a broad audience, using battery, something that we can easily relate to as a, a, a could be a good start point. Um, to start our conversation. And look at this schematic. This is essentially the essential component of a battery that powers our portable electronics and our cars, electrical cars nowadays. It's extraordinarily simple. You essentially have a positive electrode, a negative electrode. They are separated by a physical barrier. The electrolyte fills in the voids in the physical barrier. What you don't often know and what you don't often pay attention to was the key enabling factor that made the commercial success, enormous commercial success, lithium-ion battery, is not actually this component, but rather is an extraordinarily thin layer on the surface of the anode, the negative electrode. And this is known as a solid liquid interface layer. It's about 10 to 20 nanometers thick. And this is a result of the initial reaction or the decomposition of the electrolyte. The common electrolyte used are organic carbonate, 
ethylene carbonate, dimethyl carbonate, diethyl carbonate, for instance. Upon electrochemical decomposition, and of course, they're also salt. That's where the fluorine comes from. The phosphorus hexafluoride, for instance, is a common salt used. What people realize that upon the initial electrochemical reduction, the electrolyte, both the solvent and the salt, could be decomposed and deposited on the surface. And the layer to today is not fully understood. But if, if it was not for this layer, we wouldn't have seen today's uh, success. As a matter of fact, if you look at the history of the battery development, between 1970s and early 1990s, uh, researchers really struggled to get reliable performance out of this concept, simple concept. As a result, you know, this concept remained a scientific curiosity. It wasn't until graphite was introduced. And then this is this God-given gift where the inlet reaction between graphite and the electrolyte on the electrochemical reaction conditions form this layer. What we do know today is that this layer, is, uh, this layer contains multiple components toward the surface of the electrode is a more inorganic component such as lithium fluoride, lithium carbonate, and some lithium oxides. And when you move out toward the solution, you have a more of a, a organic component. This reminds me of how our, our biological system reacts to a foreign object such as a medical implant, right? So we, our body would coat it with layers of material and cap it with a protein to make it less foreign to the body. This is a very similar principle. The most important concept here I wanted to argue is that this layer is intrinsically formed, but incredibly important. What it does is that it allows only lithium to go through, but not electrons. It means that where electrons will meet lithium would be at this interface, but not away from it. So why does that even matter? Why is it important? And you should be asking, why are you telling me all this? Well, if you don't have this layer, what happens is that when lithium deposits, it has a tendency to do what's called the dendrite growth. And this is one of the intrinsic properties of lithium. Many factors contribute to it. For instance, at the tip, you probably have a very high electric field. So that's why lithium prefers to deposit here. It also has relation, uh, also is a, a result of the intrinsic properties of lithium. But to make the long story short, when you have this dendrite growth, what it does is that it could really grow into an arc. It's like a lightning arc. It can penetrate the separator and short the anode and the cathode. And that's when you may have a spectacular failure. And this is a huge problem, and particularly for public perception. So as you can see, the SEI is the key, is really the last stand that pre prevents this from happening. And you may be noticing you know, from my previous slide animation that I showed the anode or the cathode different from the typical cathode. And this is because you know, the enormous success now we have here with the cathode material as typical intercalation layer structures where lithium can go in and come out at ease. And they are great because they allow for repeated charge and discharge, but they're also horrible because they typically feature transition metal oxide that carry a lot of dead weight. I call them dead weight with a quotation mark. And this is because again, you know, in order to provide the reliable insertion and disintegration. Uh, you do need transition metal whose oxidation state can be toggled without collapsing the structure. As a result, uh, theoretically, this old concept can support a specific energy density close to 300 watts hour per kilogram. And that's a number important to remember because you know, this is number that will not meet our needs to electrify most of our cars, for instance. And of course, you know, I'm sure you also have the moments where you have the anxiety of uh, your battery, your cell phone battery is running out. So in order to break the barrier, we need to switch to something different. We need to switch to, for instance, two ideas that have been floated around and further develop is lithium sulfur battery and lithium oxygen battery. 
What's very important is that for this new concepts, that's why I have this post lithium ion battery in my title here. For this new concept to work, we really need to replace the anode. Using graphite will not make the cut. And only metal that's gonna work to break the barrier will be lithium. For instance, uh, Department of Energy has a very large project called Battery 500. The goal, you, you know, it's called 500 because their goal is to reach 500 watt hour per kilogram. It's a convenient number to remember. So the bottom line here, the tech home message here is that there is a lot of interest trying to enable lithium as a new anode material. It features the highest capacity. It features the lowest electrochemical potential. So why are we not using it? Well, this is because most electrolytes don't really form a good SEI with lithium. And then you're gonna have problems like showing on the left-hand side. You don't want that to happen. So here I wanted to use one recent paper jointly published by e Swiss group and the Jernan Boss group at Stanford to illustrate some of the design principles or design considerations of electrolyte. The bottom line is that when you choose electrolyte, you want it to provide good solubility, good stability. Solubility can be afforded by, for instance, you know, polar solvents such as ether functional groups here. And in order to improve the stability, you can try to extend the linear chain of the alkyl group. And this is one principle people have followed. But the catch is that you don't want to do it too much. Otherwise, the solubility will become an issue. And then to further increase the stability, and particularly for high potential cathode materials, for instance, manganese-based materials, and try to uh, substitute hydrogen with fluorine to fluorinate this carbon is very helpful. But the catch is that you don't want to fluorinate the carbon right next to oxygen. You have to really fluorinate it away from it, otherwise solubility becomes an issue. So th there are a lot of good success that has been uh, uh, Demonstrate, and this is an area that I think a lot of people with you know a synthetic um, background, a synthetic interest, can contribute. I do want to mention, however, that cost, a techno economic analysis, is very important. Uh, fluorinated solvents tend to be overly expensive, and their prospect for commercial success remains low. But you know, it's a really interesting research topic. So using this as a segue, I wanted to introduce a recent study done by Hao Chuan together with a former student, Jin Ru Luo, who graduated over the summer and now works for a battery company in San Francisco area. So the insights showing on the previous slide and many other papers really have prompted Hao Chuan try to think how to enable lithium operation. And they're really ambitious. They didn't want to just use the conventional electrolyte. They also wanted to use what's so-called non-flammable electrolyte. So in other words, the organic carbonate tend to be all ether. They tend to be fairly flex flammable when the short happens and then it's really ex exacerbates this uh, situation and it leads to the spectacular explosion. That's what we don't want. So they wanted to look at the non-flammable chemicals. And one of them would be this organic uh, Phosphate. In this structure, phosphorus can help capture hydrogen radicals. Hydrogen radical is a very important intermediate in the chain reaction of combustion. And one of them is the triethyl phosphate, in short TEP. And this has been used as a flame retardant uh, in some of battery studies by mixing this with existing carbonate. But when you try to use you know, literature research has shown, and also how trans research has shown that when you try directly use TP with lithium, this is what happens. The deposited lithium looks like spikes. It's, you get this beautiful rod. They're very loose. They really kind of extend into the, uh, uh, into the surface, uh, into the solution. This is bad for a number of reasons. In addition to that, this could penetrate through the separator and the short circuit, which is bad. Also, you will notice that there will be very narrow necks at this contact. And when you try to oxidize this, that is during the discharge, for instance, and lithium here could be first 
uh, oxidized. And what that will do is that it cuts the connection between the rest of lithium with the current collector. And hence, this will become a loose lithium, that's a dead lithium, that will float away. It poses a number of problems. First, you no longer be able to access the capacity stored in this lithium. And more importantly, over time, they deposit and could short the circuit. What they found was very striking. And this problem seems to be able to be solved by adding a little bit of oxygen to the system. And look at the top view SEM and the side view. It appears that just by adding a little bit of oxygen, keep in mind that oxygen has a fairly low solubility in TEP. And the deposited lithium seem to be compressed by a hand. And what happens? So this is very interesting. So Hao Chuan and Jin Ru propose a number of hypotheses on this process. The first one they tried to test was that, well, oxygen, the electrochemical characterization proves that oxygen could be first reduced on the surface of lithium. Once reduced, one electron process will give you a superoxide radical. And this radical could decompose the salt. They paid attention to this because in the literature, there is a trend where people try to use a highly concentrated salt, particularly TFSI, that's the salt, for, because the decomposition product contains fluorine and that can help, uh, for instance, you know, represented here as lithium fluoride uh, to serve as a functional SEI layer. Their control experiment proved this route is unlikely. Alternative reaction could be that this oxygen just reduced by lithium and form lithium oxide. Lithium oxide has also been tested as a component for SEI. Their study also proved this is unlikely. So this left the most likely process to be oxygen induced or electrochemically induced decomposition of TEP. So with the help of our new colleague, Lucas Ball here at BC, and, uh, who is expertise in DFT calculation, computational chemistry. Ho Tran and Jin Ru, they propose this reaction mechanism that involves superoxide radical attack the phosphorus, releasing this ethoxy oxide, lithium oxide. And then eventually it leads to a chain reaction that forms lithium phosphate or polymeric lithium phosphate. And in the literature, this material have been shown to really help regulate lithium deposition. You know, you can clearly see the striking effect of this. The green trace here, they're a little bit cramped together. You may not be able to see, that's essentially a cycle. So each up and down basically represents one cycle. In the uh, magnified view here, the inside, you can sort of see it. So without oxygen, the overall potential of the system quickly go up. And this is a representation of a lousy surface is formed, but with oxygen, and this can maintain for much longer. So I think this is, you know, interesting study. It illustrates that the chemically induced, electrochemically induced chemical reactions can be taken advantage of for, to our benefit. Of course, this is a, you know, a single study and there are a lot of uh, extra work to be done. But I hope it illustrates the complexity of the electrochemical reaction at the interface and how one might be able to take advantage of it. So I would like to take a quick pause and tentatively reflect. The point I wanted to make in the first part of this talk was that complex chemical reactions can indeed take place. Sometimes they're very difficult to fully understand. The reason, uh, one reason that they're difficult to understand is this interface is a quite complex system. It has molecular structures. We have a set of tools to study molecular structures, but none of them is good to study a heterogeneous surface, a solid surface. There are tools to study solid surfaces, but those tools cannot be particularly powerful in revealing the molecular structures. So this point I'll come back later, but it doesn't mean that Without this knowledge, we cannot really take advantage of this. So now I wanted to encourage you to ask the question here. Okay, so you have told me about the possible reactions on the surface, but how the heck is this connected to the center for integrative catalysis? 
And I sort of already alluded to this, but in order for me to fully answer this question, I wanted to take another detour. I wanted to come back to another fundamental concept of electrochemistry. So let's try to ask this simple question to our students. What is the relationship between the electrochemical potential of electrochemical cell and the Gibbs free energy of the process? If you have, you, you have taken a general chemistry, this is an easy question to answer. Essentially it's connected by the Faradic uh, coefficient and the number of electrons, this electrochemical cell potential, this is a free energy. And then if we apply this to a reaction that we know, for instance, water oxidation, water oxidation here, the way I write it, two protons, two electrons, half diatomic oxygen, the standard Gibbs free energy change will be around 240 kilojoule per mole. So the question here is that what would be the electrochemical potential for oxidation of water? Where you do the calculation, you tell me it's around 1.23 volts versus standard hydrogen electrode. And if you are confused and bored, you should hear the next question. So this is very straightforward, very simple. But under what conditions do you expect to experimentally measure this value? So I'll show you something that's very interesting on the next slide. But before going too far, I just wanted to pause a little bit to tell you why this reaction is important. Well, this reaction liberates two key components, hydrogen, or protons, and then electrons. Protons and electrons are extraordinarily important for reactions such as carbon dioxide with reduction and nitrogen reduction or nitrogen fixation. I just wanted to mention that this is a, a highly sought reaction. These two reactions are highly sought by a number of researchers. It just happens that many of our uh, center PIs are also experts in this area. Professor Chong Liu, for instance, have done some very nice work in both areas, carbon dioxide reduction and nitrogen reduction. Professor Alex Miller, of course, is an expert on solar fuel synthesis. Professor Jeff Byers, recently had done some very nice work on carbon dioxide reduction as well. But most importantly, I want you to remember that this question, under what conditions do you expect to measure this theoretical value? It's supposed to be a really simple reaction, uh, process, right, measurement. So more generally, we can ask the question is that, how do we determine the electrochemical potential of a complex multi-step reaction? So a lot of the reactions or redox processes inorganic chemists use uh, in their model reactions tend to be a single electron process, tend to feature very fast charge transfer. But what if that's not the case? It happens that water oxidation is not one of the fast reactions. For instance, iron oxide, and I talked about iron oxide because the next study we carried out was on this platform, but the same discussion should be applicable to similar systems. Iron oxide has been studied for the purpose of solar water oxidation for over four decades. But it wasn't until a couple of years ago, this is nice work by Tom Hammond Group of Michigan State, they were able to detect the key intermediate of the first step, which is essentially the iron oxo species. The rest of the species or steps remain hypothesis. The reason I'm showing all this is that each step will be a unique electron transfer process it will feature its own Gibbs free energy change and hence unique electrochemical potentials. So which one of them determines the overall measurable electrochemical potential? What is the red determining step and how is this really understood? And that's where we get the thick of this question. So a few years back, two former students of mine Graduate student Chen Du and postdoctoral researcher Xiao Gang Yang decided to measure this. It's a very simple reaction. Uh, the light data on the light doesn't concern our conversation today, so we don't have to focus on that. I just wanted to draw your attention to the dark. The key question here, again, this potential is versus the normal hydrogen electrode, and this is a pH. And then, you know, for those of you who are not familiar with this, conversion one pH unit corresponds to 59 millivolts. Uh, essentially under standard conditions. The water oxidation potential should be here, but what we measure consistently are significantly more negative. The unit is a little bit obscured, but essentially significantly more negative than this 1.23 volts. 
So the question is, what the heck is going on, right? So if you come back to this here, you really need to ask the question, are we really measuring the overall electrochemical potential? Are we measuring one of the slow steps in the process? So that's a question you should be asking. So the bottom line, really the punchline here is that once they coat the surface with a known good catalyst, amorphous nickel iron oxyhydroxide, they were able to reliably measure the potential where it is expected water oxidation potential. So the point I wanted to make is that unless you have a good catalyst, what a good catalyst in such a system mean? Well, it means that it can store all the charge for water oxidation, that's a four electron, four proton process can store all the charges and dump that electron in a single step or collect that electron in the oxidation stage reaction in a single step. And then this process has to be reasonably fast. Otherwise, you're not really expected to marry the thermodynamic equilibrium potential. So this is a very important lesson for us to keep in mind. So I said that previously on the previous slide, we're getting the thick of this, uh, the thick part of this problem this is because for most heterogeneous catalysts, like a solid electrode, the water oxidation mechanisms are not well understood. And hence, their electrochemical potential is all over the place. Although the theoretical uh, calculation shows you it should be 1.23 volts under standard condition. So this is getting very tricky, particularly if you're working with semiconductors, where the degree of band bending enhance the overall efficiency will be determined by the difference between the Fermi level of your semiconductor and the electrochemical potential. So we got frustrated. And that's the point. We're getting one step closer to the center of integrated catalysis. A few years back, this is a, by two graduate students, former graduate students, Wei Li and Da He. They started asking the question, can we take advantage of the knowledge, detailed knowledge of the chemical processes of a molecular catalyst and also take advantage of the convenience of electrochemistry, or the surface the electrode, and the interface them, and more specific, immobilize them. It was at that time, our collaborator, Gary Bravi group, was able to synthesize this, it's basically called homo, homogeneous water oxidation catalyst, it's a heterogeneous water oxidation catalyst. Essentially, it's, it's the uh, pilac a uranium complex, once chemically oxidized, can form this dimer, the dimer features this water ligands that can be exchanged with the hydroxyl group on metal oxide surface. They demonstrated it works really well on ITU and titanium oxide, for instance. So we took their catalyst, we put it on hematite. Hematite is a mineral name of iron oxide. And it really allowed us to look at the details of the kinetics and thermodynamics. The most important thing here is that we haven't got where we want it to be yet but it got us sort of into one foot into the field of molecular catalyst. So our end goal would be able is to get a system whose chemistry is well understood. All the chemical steps are well understood. So we can write out the electrochemical potential. We can also specifically know where, which step determines the overall electrochemical potential. So we have full knowledge of the system, but we are far from there yet. But in this particular study, what we have proven was that when we have this molecular catalyst on the surface of iron oxide, it helps charge transfer, but it does very little in terms of charge recombination. And that's the key point of this study. But the connection to the center now is already established. It is at this time, at this point of time, that nice work done by my colleague, Jeff Byers here, the BC that caught our attention. So you, if you, have seen the previous webinar from last month. Um, you should already have heard the part of the story. If you haven't, again, I encourage you to go to YouTube to watch that video. But the bottom line here is that Jeff's team was able to make this bisimino purity iron complex and then use chemical reductant or oxidant, you know, ferrocenium or cobaltsin try to toggle the oxidation of the formal charge of iron from two to three plus. And this different oxidation state will exhibit different reactivity. For instance, this one is highly active toward lactide polymerization, whereas the oxidized form 
is particularly active for epoxide oxidation. And what they did was using chemical oxidant. This is great. It's very elegant chemistry, very interesting. But you know, we ask this question, can we replace the chemical oxidant? Chemical oxidant is good, but you have to synthesize somewhere else. You have to put it in, and there's a host of challenges associated with chemical oxidant. Can we do something more simple? Can we locally use an, an electrode to do that? The question wasn't asked by me, but rather by two talented students. Chi Dong was a former student of mine, and Miao Chi was a former student of Jeff's. Uh, Miao graduated this year, uh, Chi graduated last year. These two are talented students. Uh, they're probably not on job market this year, but in the coming year, they're probably on job market. And if you're looking for faculty, I think they are great candidates. But the simplicity, it, it's really a little bit misleading, right? So if you apply a potential, you can oxidize, you know, reductive potential, you can oxidize iron uh, from three to two. Alternatively, you can oxidize it back from two to three and enhance, you can control uh, the different polymerization. Again, the details were presented by Jeff, but I just wanted to mention some thoughts that have gone into the design of the electrochemical cell. For instance, to improve the charge transfer, what Qi and Miao they have developed, they were using a carbon fiber as a working electrode. Why did they use carbon fiber? Well, the idea was try to improve or increase or maximize the contact area between the electrode and the complex so as to minimize the time it takes for this reaction to happen. Our end goal is basically, it's like a switch. You turn it on, you polymerize one thing, and then you turn it off, it's, you polymerize another reaction. Um, and the, the you know, latent time here is critical, right? We want it to be as short as possible. Also, they've had a great deal of attention to the counter electrode. When iron here is reduced, something else has to be oxidized. If you don't control it, you are going to likely oxidize either your solvent or worse still, the recently reduced complex, right? You don't want that. So this is where our experience working with lithium battery comes into handy. So what she designed was to use a membrane to, set it, uh, to separate the rest of the cell and use the lithium. We paid attention to lithium not only because we were familiar with this, how to work with it, under electrochemical conditions, but also because Jeff's team has shown that lithium ion in the solution shows very little interferences with the reaction, with the polymerization reaction. And uh, some other thoughts, you know, this is how it looks like uh, in real life. Um, you know, I always consider what ugly design here, right? But it works, it works great. And one other challenge they had to overcome was the incompatibility of lithium with the solvent used for the polymerization. So you can see that, you know, for the, uh, they, they really use the different uh, a system for this. When you do a CV scan like this, the number of charge passes through the system is minimum. You really don't have to worry too much about the counter electrode design. But when you're doing electrolysis, we are dealing with a large quantity of chemical. This is something you need to care about. In other words, for chemical synthesis, electrochemical synthesis, this is particularly important. Another thing I wanted to point out is that for the reference, in order to accurately calibrate the potential at which iron is uh, reduced, and the Qi cleverly used the lithium iron phosphate, which is a known cathode material for lithium ion batteries. A unique property of lithium iron phosphate was that it features very stable electrochemical potentials under a wide range of lithium uh, composition. That's very reliable. And then converted to what's very commonly used in organic chemistry, such as ferrocene, ferrocene. So with this in hand, this is when Hao Tran joined the group a couple of years ago and joined the team. They wanted to do something one step further. Really, I think it's an elegant design. The idea, you know, on the previous slide, you will notice that now this is pretty much a homogeneous system. And then all we did was to replace the chemical oxidant or reductant with the electrochemical one. It's not a small undertaking. I don't want to make it seem easy, but that conceptually, that's what happened. So the next step is where I link everything I presented today together, right? So that's where 
my long-term interest as well is try to immobilize molecular catalysts with a solid surface. There are a number of advantages for doing so. For instance, one thing we can envision is that you can immediately imagine you can form patterns. This pattern is only limited by the size of today's fabrication. The last time I checked here, the commercial success is already at five nanometer. So you can connect one pattern on the surface and turn that into a different oxidation state. For instance, you turn iron two to iron three, and then you immerse this to a mixture of both lactide and epoxide. They will polymerize differently. So now you can actually achieve pattern polymers on the surface without going through the complex fabrication processes. So this is a quite interesting idea. And of course, there are a number of fundamental challenges or research opportunities as well. For instance, one question we asked ourselves was, I alluded to that earlier in the tentative reflection, when we have a molecular complex on the surface, how do we characterize it? It turned out to be not that easy. How do we prove we have a molecular complex? How do we prove that this molecular identity is preserved? How do we prove that the chemical reactivity is preserved? So of course we can do what a lot of material scientists can do. This is what I am familiar with. For instance, we can look at elemental distribution and nicely, here you see titanium because the support, the solid support is titanium. And what's important is for you to remember is the pyridine and iron, they're corresponding to each other. But the real powerful information comes from mass power spectroscopy. Uh, we benefited from the uh, mass power spectrometer at Harvard Ted Badley Group. And what's really important, the key take home message without going into the details here is that the spectroscopic features of both the iron two and iron three complexes are very similar to the dissolved iron complexes in the solution. So we have confidence that we now have a complex that can give us the desired switch behavior as well as the polymerization uh, results. So I'll show you on the next slide how the polymerization worked out. We can characterize it by a number of methods. IR showed us that we indeed have lactide, polylactide, polylactide here, and also polyepoxide on the other side. And, but we used a tool that can give us a spatial information, a scanning Raman spectros, spectrometer. And then we can use characteristic peaks of these two different chemicals we can map out how the distribution is. And if you don't believe me, you can also look at the dyed surface, PLA and PCHO, they dye differently. The dye here we use is rhodamine 6G. And then it clearly shows that by a single step, a mixture of precursor polymerization, we get the different chemicals on the surface. It's a very small step forward. But on the other hand, you know, I can argue this is a huge step because it really helped us to demonstrate the concept. We're very excited to see what we can do next with the system. With that, I think my time is already up. I wanted to offer some concluding thoughts. So electrochemistry can be a powerful technique for synthesis purposes. And particularly for integrated catalysis, I showed you in our grand vision because it can offer very convenient switching on demand electron a supply all deposition. But you wanted to remember that electrochemical system can be fairly dirty. And you know, I even didn't get to talk about a lot of interesting studies, for instance, one by our colleague Matthias Wegler here at BC about how even just changing a cation at the double layer can change the reactivity by a large magnitude. So the bottom line I want you to walk away with is that great attention is really needed to understand and more important, even control the desired reaction. When you can't control that, you better learn how to live with it. You wanted to pay attention to the overall system, not just working electrode, but also the counter electrode and possibly cell designs. Lastly, and this is sort of abrupt from the rest, but I think this, you know, we're only uh, taking a baby step toward this direction, being able to interface molecular catalyst with a solid substrate with this electrode, I think will open up doors to a host of new possibilities. I'm particularly excited by the last point myself personally. 
with that, I wanted to end here and see if you have any questions or comments. All right. Um, thank you very much for um, Professor Dongwei Wang for a nice talk. Um, I would first of all, I like to encourage students to ask questions and and the dens um, and the faculties. But actually, we already have one question there. Um, so I can just read it out. Would oh. you mind? Yeah, go ahead, Chung, because I don't really see it. Yeah, those. I can read it out. So yeah. one is about um, when you talk about Jenan Bao's nature, nature Energy paper, you talk about fluorine, uh, fluorination of the electrolyte solvent. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, why increasing the length of the um, increasing the length of the alkyl group chain increase the stability and the, the stability and the voltage? The, so I, I think, think this yeah yeah this is a great question. And generally speaking, the longer alkyl chains can be more robust. So and then you, you don't want to do this too long, otherwise uh, the solubility will become an issue. So that's that's you know a general uh, a trend of this okay uh, so so i think um maybe the student asking a question can uh, follow up but i i hope that what what i uh, from my perspective wondering is do you know what is the fund fundamentally why the increase the alkane chain will make it uh, that's a good question that i don't have a, a very insightful answer some of our colleagues with organic background can help me out here <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, but but the students should can can follow up. I'm not sure that's the answer to the question. Uh, yeah. All right. Any other questions from students, please? Um, you can you, if you want to just you can just um, just unmute yourself and ask question too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, faculties, please. So don't I, actually, I have a question about your um, yeah. your vision about integrate um, immobilizing molecular catalysts on an electrode service. Do you think the challenge now is the characterization for when I think trying to mobilizing molecular catalysts on on a solid support and do electric chemistry? I think uh, uh, characterization is one challenge, an important challenge, but not the only one. When we get to this point, I think this is a, we're getting. Uh, into a field that I'm not, you know, uh, expert on, which is inorganic chemistry, and then we, we we need to really treat the substrate as one ligand, and how this ligand will affect the metal center, and uh, I think it gets very interesting. There there are a lot of new possibilities. The characterization right now I think is a key challenge because often we don't know what we have on the surface, and we don't have a, a convenient tool that can ready to tell us the molecular features as well as you know how it interfaces with the um the substrate so that's i think uh, i'm i'm frustrated if any anybody has a good answer to this i'll be delighted to talk with them and learn how we can collaborate oh yeah that's a good point yeah it's a uh, you're right it's hard to characterize it yeah any i have questions? a question um Danway, this might not be related to the content of your presentation, but I think um, maybe, so I see a lot of papers on non-lithium ion batteries, so like other ion <laughs> batteries. Right, um, right. Do you, I mean, I know uh, we probably don't have the time, but like, what's your view on those? Um, is it just research? Um, why do people do it? I mean, is there a future in that? Absolutely. I think, again, we, we have to, you know, right now, the challenge we face, which is climate change and how to electrify our society, our technology is so huge. We need to have all options on table. And lithium, I think, you know, will be, will prevail in a number of applications such as portable electronics, uh, transportation, these areas where we need high density. Um, but there are other sectors that require technology uh, that can benefit from the other chemistry. For instance, stationary uh, storage, grid level storage. We really need to work with uh, metal that's much less expensive. And that's where, for instance, sodium battery could become very convenient. Uh, so this is a, a place where you don't care too much. Oh, I, I shouldn't say it this way. Oh, I should say that the 
density, the energy density is not the most important consideration. A cost, where a cost is much more important. So, and the flow battery, for instance, you know, um, again, I think there, the, our um, application space is so large that we could use all technology out there. Uh, so long as you can clearly justify how this chemistry you study, we will be able to meet that goal. I think people are excited about it. Thank you. All right, any other questions? All right, if not, um, I would conclude it here and uh, thank you everyone for um, coming for today's webinar and also thank you um, Professor Dongwei Wang for a nice talk. Um, is the next one mine or am I in the next one? Um, no, I Yo. think Loy is next. Loy is one. Okay, so so in, in one month we'll have a speak, um, we'll have a, a webinar from Professor Loy Do about um, um, talking about ligand design. Yeah, I will see you in a month. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone.